what this is, is there's just really cool little short stories and they do such a great job. They have it all the way from the Old Testament, I think, into the New Testament. It has topical. They're, they're, they're awesome. They're, they're just mighty men of God. So what I want to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and open up with just this. It's about seven minutes long, and then we will get started. So remember, after Joshua led the tribes of Israel into the Promised Land, he called them to be faithful to their covenant with God by obeying the commands of the Torah. And if they do this, they will show all the other nations what God is like. So Judges begins with the death of Joshua and basically tells the story of Israel's total failure. The book's name comes from the type of leaders Israel had in this period. Before they had any kings, the tribes were all governed by these judges. Now don't think of a courtroom. These were regional political military leaders, more like a tribal chieftain. And you need to be warned, the book of Judges is very disturbing and violent. It tells the tragic tale of Israel's moral corruption, of its bad leadership, and basically how they become no different than the Canaanites. But this sad story is also meant to generate hope for the future. And you can see this in how the book's designed. There's a large introduction that sets the stage for Israel's failure as they don't drive out the remaining Canaanites. Then the large main section of the book has stories about the growing corruption of Israel's judges. And the progression here shows how Israel's leaders go from pretty good to okay to bad to worse. The concluding section is really disturbing and shows the corruption of the people of Israel as a whole. So let's dive in and we can explore each part a bit more. The opening section begins with the tribes of Israel in their territories in the Promised Land. And while Joshua defeated some key Canaanite towns, there was still a lot of land to be taken and lots of Canaanites living in those areas. And so chapter 1 gives a long list of Canaanite groups and towns that Israel just failed to drive out from the land. Now, remember, the whole point of driving out the Canaanites was to avoid their moral corruption and their way of worshiping the gods through child sacrifice. God had called Israel to be a holy people, and that does not happen. Chapter 2 describes how Israel just moved in alongside the Canaanites and adopted all their cultural and religious practices. And it's right here that the story stops. For nearly a whole chapter, the narrator gives us an overview of everything that's about to happen in the body of the book. This part of Israel's history, the narrator says, was a series of cycles moving in a downward spiral. So Israel became like the Canaanites, and so they would sin against God. So God would allow them to be conquered and oppressed by the Canaanites, and eventually the Israelites would see the error of their ways and repent. So God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, from among Israel who would defeat the enemy and bring about an era of peace. But eventually Israel would sin again, and it would all start over. This cycle provides the literary design and flow for the next main section of the book. It gets repeated for each of the six main judges whose stories are told here. Now the stories of the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah, they are epic adventures. They're also extremely bloody stories. Either the judge themselves or people who help the judge, they defeat their enemies and deliver the people of Israel. The stories about the next three judges are longer, and they focus in on the character flaws of the judges, which get increasingly worse. So Gideon, he begins pretty well, he's a coward of a man, but he eventually comes to trust that God can save Israel through him. And so he defeats a huge army of Midianites with only 300 men carrying torches and clay pots. But Gideon has a nasty temper, and he murders a bunch of fellow Israelites for not helping him in his battle, and then it all goes downhill from there. He makes an idol from the gold that he won in his battles, and then after he dies, all Israel worships the idol as a god, and the cycle begins again. The next main judge is Jephthah, who's something of a mafia thug living up in the hills, and when things get really bad for Israel, the elders come to him begging for his help. And Jephthah was a very effective leader. He won lots of battles against the Ammonites, but he was so unfamiliar with the God of Israel, he treats him like a Canaanite God. He vows to sacrifice his daughter if he wins the battle. This tragic story, it shows just how far Israel has fallen. They no longer know the character of their own God, which leads to murder and to false worship. 
The last judge, Samson, is by far the worst. His life began full of promise, but he has no regard for the God of Israel. He was promiscuous, violent, and arrogant. He did win, brutally, strategic victories over the Philistines, but only at the expense of his own integrity, and his life ends in a violent rush of mass murder. Now, a quick note here. You'll notice a repeated theme in the main section of the book, that at key moments, God's Spirit will empower each of these judges to accomplish these great acts of deliverance. Now, the fact that God uses these really screwed up people doesn't mean he endorses all or even any of their decisions. God is committed first and foremost to saving his people, but all he has to work with is these corrupt leaders, and so work with them he does. This whole section is designed to show just how bad things have gotten. You can't even tell the Israelites and the Canaanites apart anymore, and that's just the leaders. The final section shows Israel as a whole hitting bottom. There are two tragic stories here, and they are not for the faint of heart. They're structured by this key line that gets repeated four times at the close of the book. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The first story is about an Israelite named Micah, who builds a private temple to an idol, and that gets plundered by a private army sent from the tribe of Dan. So they come and they steal everything, and then they go and burn down the peaceful city of Laish and murder all of its inhabitants. It's a horrifying story. When Israel forgets its God, might makes right. The final story of the book is even worse. It's a shocking tale of sexual abuse and violence, which all leads to Israel's first civil war. It's very disturbing. And that's the point. These stories are meant to serve as a warning. Israel's descent into self-destruction is the result of turning away from the God who loves them and saved them out of slavery in Egypt. And now, Israel needs to be delivered again from themselves. The only glimmer of hope in this story is found in this repeated line in the last part of the book. It actually forms the last sentence of the story. Israel has no king. And so the stage is set for the following books to tell the origins of King David's family, the book of Riv, and also the origins of kingship itself in Israel, the book of 1 Samuel. But the story of Judges has value as a tragedy. It's a sobering explanation of the human condition, and ultimately it points out the need for God's grace to send a king who will rescue his people. And that's the book of Judges. All right, what did you guys think of that? And who did you say was narrating that? This is called the Bible Project. And uh, they do that with every book. They're, they're awesome on their ability to put a story together. Um, all the ones that I have read are spot on. I mean, I, there's nothing that I even remotely come across to say that I challenge their thought. I mean, they're, they're really good. Okay, so um, a lot of information to go through this. So unfortunately, it's not going to be one of those like the last ones where we're going to see a bunch of pictures where we went because I didn't have time to even do that. Okay, so we're going to open up with this here. It says it's an opener. It says shortly after Joshua's conquest of Canaan, the Israelites were divided up and then dispersed among the 12 tribes and regions. Because there was no established government, apostasy and disobedience became prevalent. Uh, subsequently, they would often be followed by hardship at the hand of God and his wrath. And such, judges were assigned by God to rescue the people. The judges were not kings, but were judicial and martial officials assigned to play the roles as an official with the authority to, to and task of administering justice and saving the people from a particular threat. After Joshua's death, Othniel was assigned at the first judge. He was followed by Ehud, who fought with the people of Moab. After Ehud came Shagmar, who would lead the Israelites against their arch rivals, arch rivals, the Philistines. Shagmar was followed by Deborah, the only female judge, who would guide the people of Israel to victory over the Canaanites. Deborah was followed by Abimelech, Tola, and this says Yair, but it uh, mine's Jair. 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 Um, followed by Jephthah, the victor over the Ammonites. Uh, Ammonites. Isban, Elon, and Abdon would follow, and they would were preceded by the 
valiant Samson, who single-handedly gained victory over the Philistines after Samson uh, after Samson came Eli, the priest judge, who ruled his people from Gilo Sanctuary. The final judge appointed by God before Israel would see her first king, Saul, was Samuel. Okay, so the book of Judges is a stark contrast with Joshua. So we saw in Joshua, as we heard, it was, they were obedient, they, they did stumble, they did fall, but for the most part, the book was a very big success. Going into, um, so Joshua, the obedient people, conquered the land through the trust and the power of God. And Judges, a disobedient and idolatrous people are defeated time and time again because of their rebellion against God. There's going to be seven distinct cycles of sin to salvation. Judges shows how Israel had set aside God's law and its, in its place substituted what, bleh, and in its place substituted what was right in their own eyes. And you saw that on that video. It said, and Israel didn't have its king and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. <clears throat> The consequences of abandoning God's law was corruption from within and oppression from without. God raises up military champions to throw off, throw off the yoke of bondage and restore the nation to pure worship. But all too soon, the sin cycle begins again as the nation's spiritual temperature grows steadily colder. The time of Judges. The year was about 1043 to, 10, uh, to 1004. And in the parentheses, it has the beginning of Saul's reign, and David's capture of Jerusalem. I kind of confused myself on what that meant. but There are still important Canaanite strongholds to be taken by the individual tribes. Some have been left to test Israel. What is interesting as we get into this... <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Okay, so this are the two maps that I chose to go with. Okay, so what we're going to be seeing and what you guys are going to do is you're going to start coloring this map. I made you guys two of them. So we're going to have you guys just highlight, and we're going to kind of recreate this, but I want you to go through it so you guys can see where all these are at, okay? Because in here, as pretty as this is, we're going to start finding all these little towns and little places that Israel didn't drive out the Canaanites, in which case these little pods... You know, when, when, when you say Canaan, Canaan is this whole area, okay? When you say Moabites, they're all down here. Ammonites, they're all up here. But they also have little pockets throughout of all the Hittites and the Girgashites and everything else that's in there that are all Canaanites. And, and what we're going to find is how much the Canaanites' influence on Israel with their pagan religion and all their disbeliefs and, and disobedience towards God is how they start intermingling. So instead of God going out and white, I mean, uh, instead of judges or, yeah, the tribes going in and wiping out the whole area so that they would live peacefully, they have chosen not to do that. So in this case, it here, here it says, some have been left to test Israel. During this time, Egypt maintained stronghold along the coastal routes, but we're not interested in the hillside of the hill country of Israel. So though the Philistines and all this is that Egyptian area, they had a stronghold here, but they weren't interested in the overall Israel part. The events covered in Judges ranges from uh, 1380 to 4, 1045, 335 years. Judges is 335 years of time period. Okay. So there's a lot that goes on in here. But the period extends another 30 years since it includes the life of Samuel. So you have the 335 years of everything taking place and then 30 years of the life of Samuel involved. The Christ in Judges. Each judge is a savior and a ruler and a spiritual and political deliverer. Thus the Judges portrays the role of Christ as the savior, king of his people. The book of Judges also illustrates the need of a Savior. All right. Let's see here. We're going to be doing the death of Je uh, Joshua. We're going to be going over...
350 years of dark ages. After the death of Joshua, the next generation did not know the Lord, no, nor the work which he had done. One of the stories in here, um, Japheth, Jeph, Jephthah, whatever it is, is interesting because he's actually the son of a harlot. And is that the story? I don't want to confuse it, but nonetheless, he's all like, where's the God that we heard all these great stories that brought us out of Egypt that did all this? Where, where's this person? And he says, you know, God tells him, he says, I'm with you. And he's all like, where have you been then? You know, kind of that mentality. So we're going to see that. Judges opens up with a description of Israel's deterioration, continues with seven cycles of oppression and deliverances, and concludes with two illustrations of Israel's captivity. Chapter 1 through 3, the deterioration. Judges begins with a short-lived military success after Joshua's death, but quickly turns to the repeated failure of all the tribes to drive out their enemies. The cause of failure is lack of being unified, failure to have faith in God, and lack of obedience. Deliverance, chapter 3 through 16. These sections describe seven apostates, or falling aways, seven servitudes, seven deliverances, each having five steps. Sin or rebellion. And it's cool because these were two different people. You have the S words. So you have sin, servitude, supplication, salvation. And then it ends with deliverance. The R's are rebellion, retribution, repentance, restoration, and rest. Israel continues to go back and forth of obedience and disobedience and the failure of Israel to learn from her mistakes. Chapter 17 through 21 is the depravity. These chapters illustrate religious apostasy, 17 and 18. Social moral depravity. Chapters 19 through 21 contain one of the world's worst tales of de degradation in the Bible. And Judges closes with the key to understanding the period. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And I like the way it ends here. People are not doing what's wrong in their own eyes, but what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And as we go through this, if you guys highlight your Bible, we're going to go, <laughs> it's so repetitive that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. We're going to see that over and over and over again. Okay, so let's go ahead and if you got your Bibles, we're going to go ahead and open up to chapter 1. I'm sorry? It was at the small that was a harlot. It was. After 11, yeah. Do you guys have coloring stuff? Mm -hmm. I see you got pencils, you got stuff. Okay. I brought not markers. I don't think that's going to be really good. Joe, let's see. Huh? You want some crayons? All right. Do you have Randy? Anything? You guys will have to share these. Look at how many colors you got. I'm jealous now. Sure. All right. I was going to see if I had another one, Joe, but I don't have another one of those. I have one similar to it, but you're going to work a little harder on this one. <laughs> so, okay. So, it starts off, the chapter starts off with 
the death of, of Joshua, okay? And so real quickly, it says, Who shall go first up against Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, verse 2, Judah shall go up, and indeed I have delivered the land into his hands. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and skip to verse 4, where it says, Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Pezzarites into the hands, and they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. Now, Here is where we are going to get crazy. Judah is in my brown area. There it is, yeah. Bezek, right there. It even has 10,000 men died there. Okay? So this is where our story is going to start. So if you guys want to... You see how I did mine in a color coordination? Because this got very confusing. This is what slowed me way down, is trying to put some vision behind it. Anyway, okay, so they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek and fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Pezzarites, per Perizzites. Then Adonai Bezek fled and pursued him and cut off, uh, and caught him and cut off his thumbs and toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and toes cut off, used to scrape scraps under my table, as I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Okay? I thought the story already opened up with a, what? Because what kind of king cuts off the thumbs and the toes of anybody, but these are more kings and, uh, you know, more kings. But... They say that without your big toe, you can't really walk. You know, it plays a big part in your walking. And obviously, with your thumbs cut off, you can't grasp anything. Okay? So, and then after that, verse 9, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites and dwelt in, uh, who dwelt in the mountain of the south. Who is the south? Do you guys remember? Uh, this is going to be way south. This is like every time that you hear the word the south, it seems to be the Negev or the Negev. Okay? So kind of put that locked in your mind that anytime you're reading scriptures, that's what it seems to be is down in the Negev. So Judah went down against the Canaanites who dealt in Hebron. Okay? Now, half of me would have wished that I would have read Joshua before I read any other book of the Bible. Because look what this says in verse 10. It says, Judah went down against the Canaanites who dwelt in Hebron. All my life I have been searching for Hebron. But down here it says, the name of Hebron was formerly Kerjath Arba. If I would have known that, when I was looking for him in other ones, I would have known where Kerjath Arba was at. Because I didn't realize that was Hebron. There's a lot of that that takes place in these books, which makes it even more hard to try to track things down. But later on, we're going to come to a place called Bacham. Here it is right here. Guess what town that is? Seems to be Bethel. Oh, so it's not the same place Huh? There is a Bethel oh. there. Yes. Yeah. But that is what they are, like I said, it's it's... That's what it is. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so we'll keep going. Um, and they've killed Shisha, Achaman, and Talmai. From there, they went down to the inhabitants of Debir. Debir is down here. Okay. This is an interesting story because Caleb says, whoever attacks Kirjath Sefer, which is Debir, because it says right there. Okay. Caleb said, whoever takes it, I will give my daughter as his wife. So here we have the first beginning of Othniel, the son of Kenaz. Caleb's younger brother took it, and so he gave him his daughter as a wife. Okay, So that all took place in through here. <clears throat> she goes on to ask, well, you know, give me the blessings of verse 15. So she says, give me a blessing since you have given me the land in the south. Where's the south? And they give, give me some also springs also. So Caleb 
gave her the upper springs and lower springs. Now, I don't know what a city of palms is, but what's interesting here is now the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from there. I don't think this is the Moses. Everything I stumbled on didn't allow me to believe that, but I don't know who that Moses is. But in the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the south near Arad, does anybody remember where Arad is? It sits right underneath the beer. So if you guys want to pencil in Arod here. And again, with the color pencils, if you use one color to get you through this, you'll all know that this is all Judah that we're talking about. Judah went to his brothers, verse 17. Judah went with his brothers, Simeon, and attacked the Canaanites who inhabited Zephah and utterly destroyed Homar, which is right there. Okay. So, the city of Palms was Jericho. Jericho? Okay, good. I should write that down. And if you remember the pictures last week of Jericho, I don't, I don't remember seeing too many palms, I guess, but maybe. And then Judah took Gaza and its territory. Ashkelon and its territory, and Ekron and its territory. So now we're all looking at the coastal areas here, which is interesting because this is where the Philistines are at. Verse 19, So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron to Caleb. And Moses had said that he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. Okay? So that is the success story coming right out of Judges. Okay? Now we're going to go into the failures of Benjamin. Next is Benjamin. Next will be Benjamin, I believe so. All right, so we're going through Benjamin now. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwelled with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. So I have a second little color here in Benjamin. It's also going to be Jeb, Jebus. Jebus? That will be, which I guess goes with the Jebusites. So, but that's all he has. That was his failure right there, is that little area did not, he did not um, expel them from there. First, yes, yes. 22, we're going to the failure of the tribes of Joseph. It's interesting that it says the tribes of Joseph. Because Joseph's name really isn't on that. It's all on his sons. And who's his son's name? Benjamin. Nope, of Joseph. Of Joseph that, was that was Manasseh and Ephraim, okay? So, 22, the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, okay? So now we're going to be coming up here in Bethel. Um, you see I got the blue on, on uh, Joseph. And the Lord is with them. So the house of Joseph sent spies out to Bethel. It was originally named, you guys remember the original name? Uh, of uh, Bethel. Lose? Yes, lose, laws, lose. And when the spy saw a man coming out of the city, they went to him and they said, show us the entrance into the uh, city and we'll show you mercy. Okay. I'm going to drop down to 26. The man went to the land of the Hittites, built a city and called his name Luz. Luz which is his name today. So I, I didn't even chase that. However, Manasseh did not drive the inhabitants of Beth Sheen. So here is Beth Sheen here. It's on the east side of Beth Jordan. 
It is no, just on the just on the left side. And its villages, Tanakh, and its villages, Dor, and Megiddo. Okay, so it says, however, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its villages, Tanakh and its villages, and the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of... Ib oh, I missed one. Dag, bastard. Uh, Iblimi and its uh, villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. So it came to pass that when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites under the tribute, but did not completely drive them out. Nor did Ephraim drive the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. And we remember Gezer is right up against Bezek. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Now we're going to go into Zebulun. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or Nahalol. And that's right in through here. And you might have to write them in, obviously. That's... that's <laughs> That's what took up the time on this. So that's why I thought. But I want you guys to do this because I think what's going to be a value in this as we go through this is just hearing these names. Although there are some areas that I get myself extremely confused on. Gilead and Gibeon and um, Gilgal. Those ones I just get them switched all the time. But nonetheless, they're in my head. Do you guys have Zebulun? Then you have the failures of Asher. Asher really kind of blew it. Asher's in the red. I kind of picked a red because I thought, man, this guy just kind of blew the whole thing. So you have Akko. Um, in my Bible, it's A-C-C-O. In here, it's A-K-K-O. Uh, different places that I found. Sidon, which is way up here. Alab, it's right here by Tyre. What is it called? That one is A-H-L-A-B, Alab. Akzib, which is right here. A C H Z I B. Next one is Helba. I don't know if I have Helba up here now that I think about it. Afik, which is this one. And Rahab, which is here. R-E-H-O-B. And what I found interesting is this is in the Valley of Jezreel. This is the Jezreel Valley area. So that gives you kind of what I want to do, and I can't find a good map. If you guys stumble on one, please let me know. What I want to do is find the mountains that are in Israel and the valleys and the rivers. So if you guys are stumbling around and... Because I think it'd be really cool. Because what I want to do 
and and maybe I'll even put Randy to work is have him actually draw out the valleys because I have that model. And as maybe at the end of this, we'll go back over that model and we'll be able to really see the valleys that they went through the, you know, the, the rivers that they had. Okay. So you guys got Asher. <clears throat> and then we have Naphtali. And verse 33 says, Nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemash. Yes, and... Nope. Down here. Or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, which is way up here, which... When I see a big jump like this, I have a hard time, especially with Naphtali being up here. So one of the things that you guys are going to, I hope, put together is how if, if you were to put now the tribes of Israel in here, okay, so then you have Asher, Naphtali, Dan is right here, the East Manasseh, then you have your... Uh, Zebulun, Issachar, your Gad. So try to put now in your image of this. Okay? Because now when you're starting to look through here, now you're going to see where the tribes are at. And if you kind of put that over this, if I was thinking I would have done that because that would have been real cool too. What was that bet? Uh, Beth Anath is up here by Kadesh. So I, I'm not sold on this being here, but I'm, I'm because it's Naphtali, I am pretty sold on that being there. But he didn't have too many bad failures because he only has two. <laughs> now we're going to go to the failure of Dan. The Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites, this is verse 34, were determined to dwell in the Mount Harris, in Ajalon, and the Shalbaim. Uh, oh, so this mountain here is here. Harris, whatever it is. Um, a little bit of a mystery to me because this Mount Harris also has a place over here. Um, but, and it doesn't fit Dan regardless, but in here is the Ajalon or I Holon or however you want to say it, um, where it is at. And then it goes on to say in 36, the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Akrabim and Selah. One of the pictures that I showed you guys, but I don't know if we really knew that's what it was, was the Scorpion, it's called the Scorpion's Pass. And that sits down here where Moses was at before. Um, you have the Dead Sea as it kind of goes down towards the... the uh, the Red Sea, I guess it is. Right in this patch as they're coming around Edom, coming over here, that's where the pass of the scorpions were at. So a little bit further south. All right. That's chapter one. <laughs> right? And that's just the failures. So now we're going to go be going into the judges. Okay. The first judge, if you will. And this is where... I should have probably printed off three of you guys uh, for this, but so if you want to grab and, and as I'm looking at the clock, guys, there, we're, we're going to have to have a part two on this, but we'll see if we can get through this. Um, 
So chapter two, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bo Bochum. So Gilgal's here up to Bochum. Okay. He didn't move very far. He didn't move very far. It's, it's an angel. He's, he's walking. He doesn't want to. Okay. But what I did was I put mine in yellow for an angel. <laughs> I was like, he's an angelic, angelic kind of guy. Okay. So um, he comes down. And he says, uh, I led you up from the land of Egypt and brought you into the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I'll never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I said, I will not drive them out before you. I'm sorry. Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side and their gods shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke them, the, the, these words to the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they call that place Bacham. So it was a place of tears. Bacham means a place of tears or sorrow or bitterness. Weepers. Okay. And when Joshua dismissed the people, and see, and here we are, chapter 2, who dismissed him? Joshua. So Joshua is still alive here. So Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the, border, uh, within the border of his inhabitants of Timnath Harris, which is in the mountains of Ephraim in Gash. And I think this is the one that I had no idea where this was. But it's in the mountains of Ephraim. And, and this is where it goes back to that Hirsi. So... Uh, where did I go? Wrong way. So here's the mountain of heresy in here. Harris. <laughs> okay. And that is in the world, the realm, the realm of Ephraim. So that is where, um, Joshua was buried. And then here's where it, And here's where our story takes a turn for the worse. Verse 10, chapter 2. When all the generations had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor, wor nor the work which, which he had done for Israel. So then it goes on, and it, uh, the judgment of God is being described. It's going to bring calamity on them. And then it says, And it came to pass when the judges were dead, that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers, by following, this is verse 19, other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings, nor from their stubborn ways. So it says that the Lord uh, left enemies to test them. Okay? So going through chapter 3, we're going to go to Judge Othniel. And that is here. Othniel was down here at Debir. Okay? Okay? Uh, it says that they took daughters for their own sons. And verse 7 says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. <clears throat> God sold Israel into the hands of Cush Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, and they served him for eight years. So he is, they've been captive for eight years, and they cry out to the Lord. So God raises up Othniel. Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he went to war with Kushan Rish, Rish Athaim, and God gave him into their hands, and the land rested for 40 years. As I was going through this, Othniel was 40 years, Ehud was 18 years, and it goes through, and it's like, it's a lot of time that goes by. I mean, it was pretty interesting. Okay. So, in verse 7 of chapter 3, it says, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. We went five verses, and it says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab. 
So now you have, uh, where did it, uh, who am I? Yeah, Eglon, king of Moab. So we're down here, okay? Well, Moab, okay? And took possession of the city of Psalms. And the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. Verse 15, three verses later, Israel cried out to the Lord. And the Lord raised up a deliverer for them. This is Uhud, Ehud, the son of Gera. And uh, this is a cool little story. So the Benjamite, a left-handed man, by him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was a double-edged sword and a cubit in length and fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought to the tribute to Eglon the king. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were in Gilgal. So now we are in Gilgal, which seems to be right in here. So I have Ehud and Ehud and Gilgal side by side there. And I said, I have kept a secret for you, O king. He said, keep silent. All who attended him went out from him. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in a cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he rose from his seat. Ehud reached into his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into the belly and ended up killing the king. So then Ehud takes off and he goes to Sirah, which is just outside of Gilgal. And it happened that when he arrived there that he blew the trumpets of the mountains of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains and he led them. Verse 28 says, Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. So they went down after him, seized the ford of the Jordans. So here's the ford of the Jordans. Fords of the Jordans. <laughs> There's only one Jordan. Ford of the Jordan. Okay. And uh, leading to Moab and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time, they killed 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hands of Israel, and the land had rested for eight years. 80. 80. I'm sorry, 80 years. <laughs> yes. So here we go again. We have a nice long. Nice long rest. Oh, I misread that from the very beginning. Judge Shamgar. He doesn't have anything really to say, but he's up here by um, Bethanath, up by Kadesh. And um, it said he killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he delivered Israel. That's, that's his legacy to the Bible. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a half a verse. Then we go into Deborah and Barak. This was one of those uh, interesting stories. So you're going to see that they were kind of all over the place. But this is really cool. We're going to go through this shortly and we'll probably wrap it up, I guess. Then Uhud was dead. The children of Israel began doing... Uh, here we go again. Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of uh, Jabin, king of Canaan who reigned in Hazar. So here we are here at Hazar. Okay, this is a, kind of a place that King Jabin had gone through. And he, the commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in, however you say that, Hersheth Hagoim, which is over here by Megiddo. Okay, so he's living here. They're over here in Megiddo. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. And for 20 years he had harshly opposed the children of Israel. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judge in Israel at the time. And she was sitting under the palm trees of Deborah. Now I find that a little bit interesting that <laughs> she named a place of herself. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know how that works out, but it seems like it's between Ramah and Bethel. So here's Bethel, here's Ramah. So I put it right in the middle 
of the two under a palm tree. <laughs> okay. And, um, and it's interesting on how they did that, that they were at the tabernacle tree, they were at the palm tree, they were at a, you know, they just make this, it's like, you know, here when we talk about San Mateo and Lomas, that big bank, you know, we could say, oh, the bank, you know, they had a tree. I don't, I don't. Anyway, <laughs> so she went and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali. So here's Kadesh and Naphtali. And said to him, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded go and deploy troops uh, at Mount Tabar? Tabor. So now we're here. Okay. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun and against you and I will deploy Sisera and see I don't understand this and against uh, the sons of Zebulun and against you I will deploy Sisera the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitudes at the river Kishon. So the river Kishon is right in here in the valley of, of um, Jezreel. Okay. So he's over here. They're going to send an ambush kind of thing in through here. But what's interesting is he says, Barak says to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go, I will not go. He was a coward, he was a coward right? Hiding behind, Hiding behind, 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 behind the, the, the right? Yes. So, you know, he's all like, I ain't going. If you don't go, I don't go. And she pretty much basically prophesied or, or you know, noticed that it was going to be God who's going to give them the land. But he, to your point, and so Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh and went up with him 10,000 men under his command and Deborah went up with him. Then the Hebrew, the Canaanite, and the children of Mobah, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Canaanites and pitched his tent near the Tebron tree in Zenaim and Kadesh. So Zenaim is just like on the outskirts of Kadesh. Okay. And I, and I kind of think, I don't know if this was a separation or if this was an ambush, but it says, and they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from Heshron Hagoim, <laughs> Hagoim, yeah, to the river of Kishon. So they're coming this way. Okay, they're going to get to Mount Tabor. So the battle takes place here. They're in hot pursuit. Jabin gets off. Uh, is it Jabin? Sister, uh, excuse me, Sisera had fled away on foot and he went into this woman's tent and guess what she did? She gave him a splitting headache. Verse 21 says, <laughs> Then Jael... Herbert's wife took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple. A nice woman. Okay. <laughs> and into the ground, right? So then he goes back out to, um, to Barak and says, hey, the person that you're looking for is in here. So that pretty much kind of takes that story. And then I, I tried to put some music to chapter five. It's the song of Deborah and Barak. But I couldn't get that rhythm to figure out how to sing it. So you don't get any live entertainment tonight. Can you put that map up again, please? Oh. Maybe. Today. Right? I might have to go with no. <laughs> oh, what's that? Um, the one with um, Atnia, that one there. Mm -hmm. And let me get you the big picture. Sure. And 
Oh, right. So there's, there's, can you see how this has really just taken shape with that really has slowed down? And, and we are one, two, three, four. We are four judges in, and I believe there's 12. So we haven't gotten very far. Um, This one is has Abimelech. This has Jothan, Tola, Jer. Um, this was the rest of the... And I'm still not done because I still don't have Samson in here. So I still got a few more. So with that, I think we're going to stop right here. And what I want you guys to do... See, I didn't give you this map first because I figured there'd be no turning back. <laughs> so next week, the test that we're going to have is where these judges are and the city that they are in according to this map. So you get to learn 12 places and 12 judges. Okay? But... I know we didn't go over Gideon and, and, and if you guys are so inclined, I can make you a copy of this. Um, but I want you guys, I'd rather come back and go over it one more time. Learn this. This will be the test. And what, like I said, what I wanted to think about doing until somebody said, no, don't think about it, was coming in and just quickly nailing this so we can wrap judges up put a little bow on it and call it done. So if you guys get here at eight, we'll take the test right away. Get this into your head because there's a lot, definitely a lot. Um, and then the, which I will thank God because at this point I can finish my notes because I didn't even get finishing my notes. And, and <laughs> what's even a drag is before this class started, I went through and you saw how many times I put green down. That's these all the places that they've been at. And when I got the judges, my sheet started to look like this. So I was like, oh man, I, mean, I ran out. That's when, that's when I went back to the beginning. And now I have to literally go through and start marking all the, all the places in so I can keep up with the story. But uh, okay, so let's end real quick. Then I got some quick questions. Lord, thank you so much again just to come in and be able to open up your word and see where you have your judges and where Israel continues to fail and, and, and just how you continue to just make provisions for them, Lord, and uh, setting them free. So we thank you for our freedom in you. We thank you for your gift of salvation that you've given us freely, Lord, and uh, let us not ever take advantage of that. We thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.